Welcome to another stair building education series. Let's go ahead and jump right into it with our first video. In this video, I am going to run through a few ways you can frame a landing. And um, these ways, the standard way of framing a landing with joist, which you will see in this video, is going to be the most common used. But uh, figured I would throw out a couple of different ways that you could... Uh, you know, it might be cheaper to build. You might have some scrap lumber on the project. And uh, who knows? One of these just might work for you. So here we have a method where we are simply just using a couple of different walls. If we were going to use 16 inches on center um, spacing, then we might need to add a couple of more walls in if the stairway was going to be wider. So this is about a three foot wide stairway. The walls um, spacing in between, I would imagine, would be about 15 inches. This would be fine for three-quarter inch plywood. And here's another method that might work. A wall in the middle and a couple of walls on the outside. The only thing with this is you're going to need to center the stud in here so that you can nail the wall framing in the center to the stud. You could always have the plates overlap too uh, if, if you needed to. So here we have the top plate overlapping over this wall. We would nail down with a couple of 16D nails to connect all of this together. You could do the same thing here. But I don't, don't really think it'd be necessary. Remember, the plywood is going to tie everything together. When you're nailing the plywood into these top plates, nailing down, you're going to be nailing down into this. The plywood will hold um, all of this together once it has been um, nailed. And there's the stairway. Another view of it there. And of course this is the most common method where we have the joist sitting on top of the framed walls. And if I was going to say which method would I use, this would probably be it. It is the tried and true method, and I have been using this one for quite some time. And of course, the joist might need to run in the different direction. So you can run the joist in this direction, or you can run the joist in this direction, which you'll see here in a few seconds. Voila, there it is. The joists are running in the other direction. Just don't forget that the grain of the plywood usually runs perpendicular to the joist. And for those of you who don't know, if we have a, let's just say we have a four foot wide by eight foot piece of plywood, the eight foot long direction is going to need to run perpendicular to the joist. So you would run the eight foot long piece in this direction that would cross over the joist. And again, you can run it in different directions. I've read a lot of stuff on plywood and I don't want to get carried away in this video on it, but uh, check with the manufacturer to verify the information I am providing you with in the video stairway. So again, the preferred method I would say from me. Next up on the list, you might run into a situation where you're going to need to use smaller lumber. Now, in this situation for this stairway, that is not going to happen. But I figured I would show you a method. I've done this before in tight spaces where I might have had a closet underneath the stairway and underneath the landing. And if that's the case, you might just need to, uh, you could use two by four, which we have here. And these are spaced six inches on center, not 16 inches on center, six inches on center. And you might need to check with your, um, the lumber manufacturer to make sure that these distances would be approved for your stairs also. Now here's a method that, uh, you know, will work, but uh, might not be approved by your local engineer. And that would simply be to nail a scrap piece of lumber onto the framing studs. And of course, this could run full length. And then this would be used instead of a hanger to, uh, or a ledger, I should say, to support the joist. And of course, you could always toenail the joist into the framing plates for some uh, more strength. So this is probably the stinker on the list, but 
thought I would throw it out there. You never know. You know, you nail like a 2 by 8 or a 2 by 12 underneath here. And uh, you put about uh, four nails into the studs, set something on top, nail the plywood off, and uh, the plywood's going to hold all of this stuff in place. And it's probably going to be a pretty strong landing. And again, I'm using 2 by 4 here. You might want to use 2 by 6 or 2 by 8 to uh, whatever will work for the span or the length of your particular landing. And in our last example, you could use top flange hangers. Frame the top plates like this. And another thing you could do, even though I don't have the video suggestion in here, because the plywood, like I said, is going to act as your connector, you could actually lose the top framing plates and uh, um, use top flange hangers, something like that, to save you a few dollars on your framing. So top flange hangers, again, might be the way to go. The only thing that I don't like about the top flange hangers, and I've had a lot of problems with them, I should say, when we use something like this for panelized roofs, is the fact that they usually stick up a little bit. And when you go to nail everything, um, you could have a bump in the plywood or the sheathing, and that's not always going to be the preferred method for something where you're trying to create a nice flat landing. So that is it for the video. Here is another helpful stair layout and design video. And again, I'm not going to show you how to build this type of stairway. And uh, even though I might later on create a separate book for a variety of different stairways, if that's the case, I will put a link in here somewhere for that particular book. So in this stairway here, we're just simply going to have four steps to a landing, four steps to a landing all the way around, and it'll be at 45 degree angles. And here are the measurements to scale if you were um, going to build the exact same stairway, but you're probably not going to. Yours might be a little um, wider or a little skinnier, and um, you might have more steps in it or less, step, less steps in it. You can always have four steps, two steps, something like that if you needed, three steps to two steps, three steps, two steps kind of a thing. And let's go ahead and take a look at what it might look like when you are done here. Four steps up to a landing. Just kind of go work our way around the stairway and kind of see where it lines up here. These four steps are this right here, landing here. And then this step right here would be this one right here. Just kind of go around. Nice looking stairway, probably belongs in some type of a castle there, a little larger than most people are going to need. I believe uh, 13, 14, or 15 steps is going to be the uh, average stairway for a two-story house with a 8-foot ceiling and 2 by 12 joists, something like that. Again, to our landing. Just Work our way around, landing, four steps. And the six inches here that you see is uh, the required minimum by the building code. Um, so again, the, even though I'm showing you how to lay out something like this and give you a kind of an idea of what it would look like, you would need to check with your local building department to verify whether or not you could actually build something like this um, in your particular area, um, state, county, or country. Now let me see if I can give you a more detailed idea of uh, how to kind of lay something like this out. Uh, first off, I want to point out that each one of these angles is a 45 degree angle. Now a good place to start for this type of stairway, since the measurements are going to be difficult to figure out, will be with the bottom section here. And uh, whatever your tread width is going to be, or depth. And then uh, each one of these I'm going to add 6 inches because that's what the building code requires. They do not have a measurement for the outside. They do on the inside for an angled step. So I'm using 11 inch treads. So I got four treads 
11 inches plus 6 inches, um, or, or I should say 44 inches plus 6 inches is going to be 50 inches. And we can always double check that on our original plan to see what the inside measurement was if that worked out. And the next line you're going to want to draw will be this line here, and it can be longer as long as you have an eraser or a computer to erase it with. But you're going to come off of this point here. We're not going to worry about this point. This line can be longer when we're drawing the um, first section here. And then we're going to get the intersection point after we draw this line. Then we're going to draw the steps that we need to create a um, rectangle and uh, then we are going to continue the line past and then we will stop it at the intersecting point and of course this line can be a little longer here also and then we will come off of here with our six inches so another 45 degree angle this line right here is going to be parallel to this line here and of course this line here will be at a 90 degree angle from this line here also so these lines will be parallel these lines will be parallel and of course these lines will be parallel to this line here so again we will draw this line and it can be longer we don't have to worry about this and then we will add our six inches and then our 44 inches and then we will create our rectangle again and then draw this line and then wherever it intersects here with this one then we can erase the edges or delete the lines that are sticking past it to create these corners here so again this line can be a little longer so can this one or you can stop it just like we did here where this one would be exactly exactly where we want it the only thing is we're not going to know how long this line is going to need to be um, unless we're going to do some uh, math calculations you know so this line right here can run longer or shorter you're not going to worry about it until you do the next section and of course you will do the same thing again six inches here rectangle with your steps and then draw the line to figure out where it's going to intersect here and of course the last section here won't be that big of a deal because it's going to be exactly the same as this one here so the lines right here will all line up with this particular section of the stairway so this this section right here will be an exact duplicate of this one just kind of flipped around and as a matter of fact these sections will be the same just kind of flipped around also so anyway that's it again like i said i wasn't planning on showing you how to build something like this but uh, if i get enough comments where you know uh, quite a few people want to see how this stairway is built then i will be glad to In this video, I am going to provide you with 10 things that you need to think about. I'm not going to tell you you have to do any of these. I just want to point out whether or not um, some of these make any sense and provide you with my opinion on them. So remember, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an architect. However, I have probably built over 1,000 stairways and probably spent about eight years of my career out of the 40 years that I've been doing this stuff, building stairs. So um, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. First up on the list, I know a lot of architects, uh, this is a standard detail. I can't tell you how many architects use standard details and uh, don't really know why they do. They don't know why they're doing it. It's just a standard. They might be able to tell you, hey, this is here's something I do and here's the reason, but wh whether or not it makes any sense. And uh, this isn't, I just see no need for it. You know, this just doesn't, it provides us with um, number two on our list, which is going to be a, an additional separation point. So if you think about it, I would just nail these stringers into the subflooring. You know, either cut the um, board all the way across and use double um, two bys, or, you know, um, just have the stringers set on top of the flooring. But... You know, with that, with that said, the double separation point I'm talking about is, um, you know, if you just nail it to the bottom of the stringer to the bottom of the subflooring, that's one separation point. It can actually separate from there. 
if you have the 2x4 um, nailed to the top of the subflooring and attached to the subflooring, and then you attach the stringer to the 2x4 kicker here, now you have another separation point. You have an additional point right here where the stringer can separate along with at the bottom. Now here's an example of the line going all the way across so that you don't notch it into the stringers. And again here you can see where you're going to have an additional separation point. The stringer can separate from the 2x4s, the 2x4s can separate from the wood framed floor. Number three on our list will be some type of floor framing blocks something to support the stairway or provide the stairway with additional support and means of connecting. You know, you can put additional screws in or nails in the kicker board here or in the stringers. Number four on our list will be you can always use some thicker blocks. That makes sense. You know, a two by um, could crack or split and you're like, wait a minute, I want something a little more heavy duty. Go for it. Number five on our list will be connecting the stringers. You know, I'm going to provide you with a couple different examples here. This is actually what I would uh, do, and that would be to toenail the stringers. And you can see you get a nice connection this way. If I just had a nail coming straight up, like a lot of times it's common in wall framing, you just have a nail that goes straight up into the framing. And if anything was going to happen, the stud could actually separate because it's just going to be lifting up. There's not a lot of pressure to prevent it from coming apart. But here you're going to have a little more pressure with this type of nailing here. So let's go ahead and point out that there is no kicker board here. This is how I built a lot of stairs right here. That's what it looks like. It does not look like this. I uh, What inspired this video actually was I saw somebody put a kicker board in the back. They had it instead of in the front, they had it in the back of the stringer and they attached a um, framing anchor like this to the to the kicker cart to the kicker board so the kicker board and the stringer had a nice connection like this but it could still separate from the bottom of the 2x4 in between the top of the plywood top of the sheathing and the bottom of the 2x4 kicker and hopefully that makes sense and this might be getting a little carried away but you can always go with some heavy duty hardware if you want to put some hold downs in there and let's take a look at what the stringer would look like without a block. So if you're just going to drive some 16D nails into the stringer and you're not going to have a block underneath it, the nails are simply going to go through the plywood. And this isn't going to be that big of a deal. You know, if you have access to the bottom of uh, something like this, grab a hammer and cinch the nails. Just take and bend them to the um, bend them to where they're flat with the subflooring. And this is gonna um, provide even a stronger connection. And it might actually produce a stronger connection than the blocks, because now the, the nails are gonna be difficult to pull out. So when you put a little more force on the stringer, you try and lift it up somehow, um, it's gonna take even more force to get it out because these nails are not going to just slide out real easy. Now let's put our block back in and go to number six on the list would be some type of pressure blocking. And you can see how this could provide you with some additional support. You could nail it into your blocks below, get a nice solid connection, and then go a little higher on the stringers if you want to nail into the blocks um, here. And of course you could always end nail. You know, you could drive a nail straight into the side of uh, at least one side of the block before you installed the other block. And of course, you, the pressure blocks would give you, just like the kicker board would, a means to nail the riser to it if you're looking for some more support. Also, having the riser nailed to this. I know a lot of people don't really think about it, but when you put the riser in here, um, this is going to provide you with some more support because it's connecting the stringers together. And if the stringers are fastened to the ground and uh, the middle one starts to loosen up, well, these, the plywood, the riser, OSB, it could actually prevent the stringer from moving 
um, because of the uh, structural support that it's providing it with. And I hope that may, makes sense. Number seven on my list will be to use a thicker riser with um, plywood, maybe inch and an eighth plywood, something like that. And then, of course, number eight would be to use some type of framing anchors. And again, you can see where you can create a heavy-duty connection with all of these components here. Number nine on my list is going to be adhesive. This seems to be popular. People are using it all over the place. I have never, ever used adhesive to connect the bottom of the stair stringer or even the riser to the subflooring. And I've never seen anybody do it either. But uh, so this could be my idea here. I'm going to take some of the credit for it. If not, um, then I'm uh, probably 10th uh, or 20th or thousands down the list and I can live with that. So adhesive, put it everywhere, put it under your connectors, in between your connectors, squish them in there and hope for the best. Number 10 on the list, construction standard lumber. This could provide you with some benefits, but it uh, construction standard lumber does shrink. It can warp, twist, and cup. This is going to be something you're going to have to um, think about. You know, if you're going to be um, using construction standard lumber and putting something over it, some type of uh, wood finish, um, you know, maybe some hard boards or something like that, um, and they start warping or twisting, it could pop some of your, pop some of this stuff apart. So I am going to leave you with one last tip. And uh, then that'll be it for the video. I did think of, you know, with, with construction standard lumber, if you were going to use it, you could always go underneath the framing if you had easy access and drive some screws up. You could always at attach some type of metal. Um, you know, you could use some hardware or something to, you know, um, drive the screws through if you're looking for even a stronger connection. But uh, you could use drive the screws into the stringer. If you have your kicker board or you have your um, pressure blocks, you know, screw up from the bottom of the plywood and that's probably going to give you some additional support. So that's it for the video. I hope it provided you with at least one thing to think about or one idea. And if it did, then my job was successful. In this video, I am going to provide you with a method that uh, could be um, referred to as a fail-safe method for creating accurate and precise intersection points for um, polygons or four-sided, five-sided, six-sided objects. So here we have an eight-sided object. And then we have a center point. Center point here, center point here. And then we have the angles coming off to get the intersection points. And the circle provides us with a method to get the intersecting points right where we need them. Because if they're off just a little bit, as I have in this example here, then we could have a problem. So you can use this method to double check your... Um, you know, if you're going to build, let's say, a gazebo in the backyard or a eight-sided deck, something like that, and you want to make sure that everything is precise and um, perfect, because if it's off just a little bit, then um, you could have problems with your roof, you could have problems with your handrails, and on and on. Now, in this example here, I went ahead and moved one of the lines here so that um, you can see what I'm talking about where we have a longer measurement here and a shorter one here and then the this of course would be um, this number represents what the line should be the measurement for the outside points now the biggest problem with this is where do you how do you fix something like this you know most carpenters just simply split the difference here and make a point and hope for the best, but that might not always work. Now I wanna to go to a square, just show you a square. Now a square, you don't really need this method with a square because you can, um, you're gonna have two parallel lines here. You're gonna have a, a line here that is going to be parallel to the line over here. So if the measurement's off just a little bit, for example, if I measure this 
from here to here and I can see that it is a little shorter than nine feet then I know I got a problem so I can simply move it now I'm not saying you know if I measure this right here I don't know which line to move do I move this one or do I move this one and most of the time you're going to be able to check that with you if you just cross measure these you're going to be able to see um, which line you need to move but that isn't going to be the case all the time if you come to something that's going to have more than four sides so let's go ahead and start with a center point and a center point would be um, from two lines and, and of course you can have these lines where they're not going to be perpendicular but it's going to be nice to have lines that are at a 90 degree angle from each other like we have here draw a circle whatever your whatever your dimensions are going to be and then you can create your object from that um, this here we have a six-sided object and of course you can use the degrees to find the intersecting points and then use the circle to double check those points to make sure that everything is lined up because if this happens you know and again you might not be able to see this as easy and you could actually have something that is uh, all messed up in here but if you have a circle you're it's, it's just not going to happen the circle is going to provide you with um, uh, a method that you can use to um, see where the problem actually is no problem here no problem here here's the problem and we can draw a 60 60 degree angle that's six zero and of course that uh, 60 degrees is going to be from this line here and this of course would be 60 degrees here and uh, to find our intersection point but again with our line coming across here if you just drew these lines you just went ahead and put your 60 degree angles in here um, you could end up with a situation like this it's happened to me plenty of times but once I have my circle in here I can see there's a problem and then I can compensate for it and be done with it so that's it for the video the uh, main point I wanted to hammer home I think I did in in the, the video is just that the circle is going to provide you with a method to double check these points and if you can have everything lined up perfectly where you uh, inside the circle then it's going to make um, building the rest of the project a lot easier so starting with a nice polygon equal sides correct angles uh, is just going to you're going to project's going to go fit like a glove you go to cut your roof rafters your handrails um, other parts um, uh, maybe even structural beams something like that and they're all the same size and all the angles fit together perfectly um, the job's going to go together a lot faster and look a lot better when it is done in this video I will answer a question that I received someone wanted to know what a stairway would look like at a 45 degree angle and a 45 degree angle is simply going to be nothing more than a diagonal line across a square so here we have a 10 foot by 10 foot square and of course here is our diagonal line so 45 degree angle just going to be a diagonal line connecting the corners of a square not a rectangle a square is something with equal sides and 90 degree angles for every corner so a rectangle would be something if you had a five foot side and then this one here would be eight foot different uh, side so it's a square and 45 degree angle is going to be at both ends and this is what your stairway is going to look like and the problem created of course from the steps the tread depth and the riser height is going to be exactly the same on a 45 degree angle making it um, a problem or should I say creating a problem for most of your building codes and local building departments so here we have 
the same measurement if this was going to be seven inches this is going to be seven inches and don't forget that our riser the maximum riser height for residential stairway construction is seven and three quarters inches and that would not work for the tread the minimum distance for a tread is 10 inches and that probably won't make the building inspector happy. So again, if you're just looking for a means to get from one place to another, you don't have a choice, um, do whatever you want. Use 8-inch steps and 8-inch risers, 10-inch steps and 10-inch risers. Uh, just make sure that you have a handrail there. Remember, this will not be a safe stairway, um, but you might might give you something that you can use. So again... 10 inches by 10 inches, the same measurement for the tread and the riser. And another diagram, I'm going to leave the little lines in here. I just uh, divided this up and divided this up. And here we have the lines for our stair stringer, just to give you an idea. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And... Um, in this case, here's a thousand words. This is kind of what your stairway would look like at a 45 degree angle. The depth of the tread, depth of the tread and the height of the riser will be exactly the same. So 45 degree angle won't work. I would imagine most stairways are between um, 30 and 38 degrees maybe 40 degrees but but um, 40 degrees could be pushing it so anyway i hope it helped i hope this answered your question now you know what a 45 degree stairway looks like and for those of you who didn't know what a 45 degree angle was um, now you know that a 45 degree angle is simply a line that would connect to two sides of a square that were exactly the same measurement with a 90 degree angle. Um, so a square cut in half diagonally is a 45 degree angle and will not make most building inspectors happy. In this video I will be providing you with a little more construction math and uh, we're going to figure out the ratio, the percentage and the degrees at which something like this might be. Now you could use this for driveways, sidewalks, um, anything actually where you need to figure out what these, what the slope would be in a couple of different forms. And the most common form of uh, slope you're going to be dealing with will be a ratio, and that is because it's the easiest to figure out. So most of the time, uh, your building codes and stuff like that are going to be related to that. You're not going to have to figure out the percentage or the degrees, but either way, we will take it here and give it a shot and see if it makes sense to you. So here we are starting out with a level, perfectly flat piece of concrete and uh, ground. And we are simply going to raise it two inches and use this to do a little bit of math or uh, provide you with a couple of formulas. And again, I'm going to walk you through everything with the calculator. I know a lot of times I find on the Internet where they have a formula or they tell you how to do it and you're like, OK, you know, what buttons do I push on the calculator? Well, here I will show you on this particular calculator. In our first example, we are going to be um, working with the ratio formula. And the first thing you're going to need to do will be to convert the units of measurement to the same. So here we have four feet and uh, two inches. We need to convert either this to inches or this one to feet. We've got to work with the same units of measurement for a ratio. So we are going to take four feet and convert it into inches. There are 12 inches and a foot. We're going to multiply four times 12 gives us 48. And then we are going to divide it by a common number. And of course two uh, divides into four foot. So we're going to use that. But we're going to need to divide both the 48 and the two to get our ratio. 48 divided by 2 equals 24. 2 divided by 2 equals 1. The ratio for this would be 1 
in 24, 1 to 24. So for every 24 um, units, which would be inches, it's going to rise one inch. And this should make sense to you because 24 is half of 48. And if we have a two inch overall rise uh, at the end, then in the very middle, we should have half of this number, which would be one inch. Now this was an easy, easy do here. Let's go ahead and bring in our calculator. And, uh, and now we're gonna take a number that doesn't really divide evenly. Um, into itself. So we're going to have 50 inches instead of 48 and 3. We're going to go up 3 inches instead of 2. Use the same formula here and we're going to come up with 1 in um, 1 as a ratio of 1 to 16.66. Now when I'm when I'm dividing these I'm just simply going to put 50 in, divide it by 3 there's our number 16.66 for those of you who aren't familiar with multiplying and dividing and I do understand a lot of times I make these videos and I lose people because I'm assuming they know how to do something and I irritate other people who think that everybody should know how to do something so meeting you halfway in the middle there and our next one here next example what if we had 11 replace the number 48 by 11 and then 2 and we can see that we have an odd and an even number here and then divide these numbers up and we have 5.5 the ratio of course would be 1 to 5.5 and of course the 5.5 since that's half of 11 and um, our ratio is 1 instead of two, we, this kind of makes sense. It goes back to that same thing I just said about uh, in the middle here. If we, this was 11 inches, then it would be in the center. It would be 5.5 would be our length. So for every 5.5, the length of the run of 5.5 units, and in our case, we'd be dealing with inches it would go up one inch and then since that would be at the end two inches now if this number changed to three then this number would be half of three 1.5 for that for that ratio so you know if it was 11 and three it might get a little more confusing because now you're dealing with two decimals but that's just the way it is in uh, figuring out the math so like i said most ratios are going to be you're going to use ratios but they're going to be even numbers you know one in 24 1 in 12. Um, for roofs, you might have 3 in 12, 5 in 12, stuff like that. But the ratio is going to be our most common number used in construction. Now let's take a look at how to create a percentage. Convert the rise and run to the same units. Divide the rise by the run. So here we're going to have 2 divided by 48. And uh, it's going to give us 0 0.0166. We can either move the decimal point over two places to the right, um, one, two. We can see here how I moved it over. Or you can simply multiply this number by 100 to get a 4.166%. So let's go ahead and do the math on this. 2 divided into 48 equals 0 0.0416. And then... We can simply just move the decimal point over two places. Each um, place that you move it over is a, um, well, I don't want to say, it's, it would be a tenth, tenth, hundredth, thousandth, um, ten thousandth, something like that. But if that's too complicated for you, this isn't that difficult. Take this number, multiply it times 100, and you're going to get 466 which would be the percentage of that. And uh, just kind of wanted to give you an idea what a percentage would look like in a slope. So if we have a hundred units here and a hundred units here, and I had a line going from here to here, this would be a 100% slope. But a 100% slope is going to be a 45 degree angle. So this is where, or, or the ratio would, of course, be one to one. You would have a one to one ratio. For every one unit you go over, it goes up one unit. So if you went over 100 units, 
um, it would go up 100 units. So that'd give you a one-to-one -one ratio. So just kind of wanted to draw a square in here to give you an idea. If I was to um, divide this up, I have this divided up into four sections. If we divide four into 100, we have 25. Um, this would be 25, 50, and 75, and then 100. So if I had a line going from here to here, and this represented my, my slope, and I wanted to know what percent that slope would be, not the degrees of that slope, but the percent, then um, I would just simply do the same thing here. Divide 25 divided by 100, 0.25, move the decimal point over and I got 25%. So a line from here to here would be 50% and a line from here would be 75%. And it wouldn't be hard to do the angles on this. So if I had an angle coming up to here, uh, this would be 40, a 45 degree angle. Coming up to here, this would be a 22 and a half degree angle, half, half of the measurement. So that would, uh, if that makes any sense. but. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the degrees. Now degrees are based off of a circle, and a circle has 360 degrees in it, or 490 degree units. So if we were to go from the center of the circle to um, straight across horizontally, and then straight up vertically, we're going to have a 90 degree angle. If we have a square in the center of the circle, and this is our center point, this is going to be 490 degree units um, for the square. So if I was to come off of the center up to here, this would be a 45 degree angle. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what the difference is between the percentages and the degrees. So let's go ahead and get out our calculator and take a look at the degrees. Now this is going to take a little more uh, math here to figure out the degrees. Not that complicated, but it is sometimes to find the inverse tangent on the calculator. And you're simply going to take the um, basically the percentage number. 2 divided by 48. 2 divided by 48 equals 0 0.0416. We did this in the last when we were working on percentages. Now the only difference here is we've got to find the inverse um, tangent key and that's going to be located on this particular calculator. And here's the tangent where we need to click on this to get to the negative or the inverse tangent. And once I click on this it's going to give me the degrees of that particular slope. 2.38 or you could uh, round it off to 2.39 since that is a 5. So that's it for this video. I hope it makes sense. I'm not going to go into a lot on the degrees. You know, like I said, the ratio formula is, is the one you're going to use the most in construction. But by now, you should have a pretty good idea what the difference is between degrees, a ratio, and a percent or a percentage. In this video I am going to provide you with a few different ideas for building deck stairs, um, treads, risers, and some of the connection points and problems you could encounter when building a set of stairs for your deck. So let's go ahead and get started. This is probably the most popular design and that would be using two decking boards and you could do this with uh, all of the um, engineered lumber, all of the man-made manufactured lumber instead of wood, or I should say materials instead of wood. But in this case, we're just simply using two two by sixes here. Has an eighth of an inch gap in between it. And uh, one of the boards would have to be ripped if you were going to make it 11 inches. But this isn't going to be the case all the time because sometimes lumber that you get is going to be a little smaller. This would just all depend upon the stairway. So here is our first design. Two by six, no nosing. There's no overhang on this stairway. No one inch nosing, uh, which is common. The second most uh, popular stairway for a deck would be using two by twelves and in some cases two by tens, but uh, remember the minimum for a stair, um, the 
depth of a stair tread is going to be 10 inches for residential, 11 inches for public stairways. So, and again, you have to check with your local building department for that information. Um, again, this is one you're going to see all over the place. 2 by 12 treads maybe leading up to a deck with 2 by 6. You know, you're rarely going to come to a deck where you're going to have 2 by 12 decking um, on it. As a matter of fact, I've never seen one, so but I have seen this exact setup right here plenty of times. In this example, we are using two different boards to create a different design. And again, this isn't a real popular design, but something that uh, you could consider using. A 2x10 and a 2x4. One of these boards will need to be cut or ripped. You know, in this case, I ripped this one here down to 3 inches. So we have a 9.5 inch wide board and then a 3 inch board with the eighth of an inch gap in the center. So just another design. Now we do have a nosing on this one. And you can see it a little better here. However, we don't have something at the top. And this is common. I see this a lot. You know, you have a one inch overhang and you come up to a landing and there is no nosing on it. So again, I cannot tell you how many times I have seen this. That is not going to be acceptable. You need to put the nosing on there. No nosing, nosing. And you can do that by simply moving the decking and laying it out accordingly or just putting a larger board here. If you made a mistake when you have everything even, just get a larger board if you can. I mean, you can really see where something like this is going to become critical if you are using manufactured materials for decking. And, uh, um, you know, you're only dealing with a 5-inch board or a 7-inch um, board, and you can't get it in a larger board. That could be a problem. Another thing I need to point out, and without the nosing, you can see how this would not be straight. And, of course, a straight edge might provide you with a better idea what I'm talking about. If you took a straight 2x4 or a level straight edge, something like that, and set it on top of the stairs, then it should touch each one of the front corners of the treads, or at least be close within an eighth of an inch kind of a thing to have a nice straight and safe stairway. So our next design would be three boards uh, shaped to uh, create this design. And I think I have um, four inch boards here, maybe four and a sixteenth of an inch to create the one inch overhang and the eighth of an inch gap that we need for our deck stairs. So another another pattern there you can use if you like it. Now before I provide you with some design ideas with risers, I just kind of wanted to point out a couple of problems you could have by simply adding the risers. So in order to do that, I went ahead and I left the previous treads or the front tread um, in, in its place where it was. So you can see here by adding an inch and a half riser, we are going to be, um, we're gonna be getting rid of our nosing. And of course we might need to readjust our stair tread designs. And the bottom really isn't going to be as big of a problem. When you add a riser to the front, whatever thickness it's going to be, as long as it's the same, you add an inch and a half thick riser to the front and then an inch and a half riser to the next one, you're still going to have the same distance here. We're still going to end up with 11 inches, which would be the same distance um, that we would have on our stringer. But that isn't going to be the case at the top. We're going to have to add an additional riser, whatever it is, or readjust the stringer. The width here will need to be cut down. So if we, if we didn't add the riser here, but we added the risers to the rest of the stairway, then we're going to have a step. Um, our upper step here is going to be an inch and a half longer, which is going to create a problem. So you're going to need to compensate somehow for your risers, um, either in the stair stringer, 
the ledger you're going to use or in the um, framing of the deck. And don't forget that the nosing on the um, decking will also be affected by this. In this example, I went ahead and reduced the length of the stair stringer here. It was nine and a half inches before, reduced it to eight inches to make everything work. And we have two by risers, two by eights that got ripped down to seven and a quarter. We have seven and a quarter inch treads here, or risers, and 11 inch treads. So the treads would have needed to be two by 12 ripped down to 11 inches, unless you could find some 11 inch lumber. And of course here we have everything is working out nicely. No nosing on this one here. And this has been adjusted accordingly. Now this is another problem I noticed with deck stairs. They don't ever, you know, some of the people don't adjust for the soil level or the grass. I've seen deck builders go in and then uh, they build the deck according to the soil level. And then the homeowner plants some um, grass and then pretty soon they have a, you know, a five inch step here. Or it's, it's not even close to the original um, design. So keep that in mind um, when you're planning and designing your stairway. Because you could always um, lower or raise the concrete footing if, uh, if you need to. And that's what the stairway would look like. And another view of it there. Now here's a design idea I don't see very often, but again, if it works, use it. If you um, can use a two by six for your riser and it's gonna have a gap here and you're fine with it, go for it. Save a couple dollars on lumber and um, if you're gonna put a skirt board on the side of it, you would never even see it. So just again, another idea. Next up on the list, instead of a 2x6, you could use a 2x4 as long as the distance here is less than 4 inches. Remember, most building codes um, will not allow a stairway or the handrail, guardrail system to allow a 4-inch round sphere or ball basically to slide through any part of the stairway. So you'd have to check with your local building authorities to verify that information. So just another idea. Now if you didn't like that idea, maybe you'll like this one here. We'll use a couple of 2x4s for our risers. And uh, if you're using construction standard lumber, this might not be a problem. Uh, the manufactured lumber, of course, uh, engineered man-made materials might be a problem, as I mentioned earlier. So two by four, seven and a quarter inch riser should, should work out nicely. Three and a half inches, an eighth of an inch gap, three and a half inches, eighth of an inch gap, and you are in business. In our last example, we are going to keep the risers, use the two two by fours, and then switch the treads to a couple of two by sixes. And what I did here was I just went ahead for the 11 inches Two two by sixes are going to give you 11 inches. If we add an eighth of an inch gap and an eighth of an inch gap, we're going to come out with um, 11 and a quarter inches. So I just kind of left the quarter inch nosing sticking um, out. Uh, just another idea, uh, an option if you don't want to rip the lumber down. Now, if you're using pressure treated lumber, you're probably not going to want to rip it down because you're going to have a, a side that would need to be treated or um, you know, or, you know, you could put it up against the back of the tread if you don't want to see it. Um, but, uh, you know, this idea right here might actually work better for pressure treated lumber um, or even the man-made decking where you don't want to cut it and uh, kind of mess up the design if it has a certain amount of grooves or whatever the de design is in the step. And of course, I need to point out again that whatever the overhang is here, if it's a quarter of an inch, a half inch, make sure that you match it above. Here is another video with construction math in it. And of course, this is just another attempt of mine to try to explain what some of these geometric figures are, how you can draw them 
and how you can use circles and squares and angles kind of a thing. And I know that I've already made a few of these videos and I might make some more in the future, but the whole, my goal here is to try and have one of these things, one of these methods resonate with uh, people. And it's like, you know, I might make a video where 20% of the people get it and I might make another video and uh, maybe a, another 30% understand it. So that's just kind of where the where I'm going at here with my thought process. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to draw an octagon and I don't have a square shape, uh, shape here. It's a rectangle. And but we are going to have a starting point and the starting point is going to be um, four lines that are at right angles kind of a thing. So you would just draw a line down the center and then a line down the center of this. And this isn't hard to do. I actually have a another video. I'll put a link here to that. And for those of you who you might have a difficult, you might not be starting with a square side. If you have a straight line you're starting with, then to make something like this, you can do it with a tape measure most of the time and maybe even a framing square. So we're going to start there. I'm going to come out six feet, um, draw a line there, and then we're going to draw a circle. So the circle is going to have a six foot radius. And then you're just simply going to connect the dots. So this is kind of something we can do as uh, kids. This isn't difficult. We're just going to connect the corners here with some straight lines. And then we are going to draw four more lines down the center. So we just need to measure the length of this. And let's just say it's 10 feet. Then we're going to come to 5 feet make a mark so that we can draw a line. We're just going to connect the dots across here. So not dead, that, not that difficult. Uh, I understand it could be um, still difficult. For me, I'm looking at it. I understand. I drew everything, you know, drew it before I made the, made the video. So don't, you know, I know that there are a lot of people that, ah, oh, I feel like an idiot if I, if I don't get this. Uh, just Bear with me. Watch the video a couple of times and uh, hope it'll uh, make sense eventually. So and then we're just going to connect the dots again. We're just simply going to connect the dots or the lines here where they meet. So here we have it. There's our octagon. So this really isn't that difficult. Um, once you see it done, I'm hoping it's not that difficult. There it is, octagon with um, some circles and some squares. In our second example, I'm simply going to take two squares and I'm going to connect again. We're just connecting the dots with two lines across here. And this might not be practical in the field, but you might be able to, this might be able to help you if you are using some type of uh, software like I have here. And uh, what I'm going to do here is just simply move this one, move this square over. And I am going to line it up here. So I have two squares. And then I'm simply going to rotate one 45 degrees. So I'm just going to rotate it 45 degrees. So if we were to line the squares up, you could see where I would have it and I would be turning it. This, this, point here would have been this point here lined up and then I would turn it clockwise at a 45 degree angle to get this. And once I have this, once I have this, you can see where the octagon shape is in here. So again, this might not be practical on a uh, out in the field, but it uh, it uh, you might be able to use it with something like this. Now, in the field, I could see where you could do something like this. You could start with a square. Start with a square. And then if you knew this line was going to be four feet, you could always draw this at four feet and then draw a 45 degree angle. Measure the length at four feet. Draw another 45 degree angle. And you can see here where that would be a 90 degree angle off of this and then draw another 45 degree angle and then just work your way around. 
And uh, of course, you could always check it, check the accuracy by drawing a circle around. So again, I don't know how practical something like this is going to be in the field, but uh, it, it will provide you with another way to draw an octagon in uh, a computer um, software like we have here. So that's it for the video. I understand these aren't no super awesome, you know, uh, you know, you're going to be sending them uh, all over the internet. They're going to go viral, you know. But um, again, I'm just trying to throw something out there. If it sticks and it makes sense and you can actually look at something like this and understand the degrees, what degrees we're using, what lines we're using, how they connect, then it's going to, uh, very good chance it's going to help you in the field um, on your next construction project. Here is another interesting stairway design. And again, not that difficult. It looks complicated. But uh, once I show you the uh, secret here, you should be able to build something like this. I say build something like this. At the very least, design something like this. So what we're going to do is start with drawing a line down the center of our four foot by 20 foot rectangle and then we are going to come back four foot then we're going to draw a circle and you can choose whatever circle you want for your stairway the diameter or the radius this is going to have a six foot diameter and a three foot radius and I came back four feet and it provides us with a starting line right here and the next step will be to remove the rest of the circle. All we're going to need is the shape of our tread right here. And again, if you make this, if you use smaller circles, the curve is going to be sharper. You use a wider um, diameters, maybe a six foot diameter. Then the shape here is going to be, it would probably be something like this. It's going to be, um, won't be as round. So the next step we're going to do is go back in one foot increments and uh, you can uh, choose whatever increments you want to use depending upon your local building codes. Um, the building code books that we use usually require 10 inches for the minimum step for residential stairs and 11 inches for other stairs. That would be the minimum tread. So here we went one foot just to make sure that we're not going to have a problem and of course you would need to check with your local building authorities to make sure you can actually build a set of stairs like this also the next step will be to draw our next tread and of course this is going to be a three foot radius you can simply just draw it from here to here we don't need to draw an entire circle and of course that would apply to this one here also and we're going back in our one foot increments so this is the way we're going to draw the second one and we're simply going to work our way down to draw as however many treads we need and there it is there's our stairway here's the top platform or the second floor and this would be the lower deck here now let's go ahead and get rid of the center line and now it's starting to look more like a set of stairs and now let's see what it's going to look like when it is finished so here I have carpeting with wood risers, basically. That's what it's supposed to look like anyway. And I don't think a stairway like this should be a problem. You should have a problem getting it through your local building department. Um, it's still going to have the measurement is from face of riser above to face of riser below or the end of the tread to the back of the tread. Uh, and if you have a nosing, of course, it would be from the front of the nosing to the front of the nosing on the next one. So anyway, that's it for this uh, design. Hopefully it makes sense. If it doesn't, feel free to leave some questions in the comment area and I will answer them as soon as possible.